Hello, everyone. As you enter in, please feel free to put your where you are coming from in the queue in the uh, chat box. Hopefully, everyone can hear me. While everyone's popping in here, we're just going to, um, Nancy, does it show if it's recording or not? On my side, it doesn't, um, it doesn't show if there's a recording when it's in full screen. You know what, I'm gonna move out of full screen. How do I get out of full screen? Whoops. Okay. Let me just get organized super quickly here. I've got to say hello to everybody because I can't seem to go live on Facebook while I am trying to share my screen. So hello, hello. I hope everyone is coming on in here. I'm gonna share this to the Women in Publishing Summit page so that people can join us over there as well. Please let me know where you are coming from today and we will get started in like 30 seconds. Hopefully, if all goes well. <laughs> Those of you who are um, repeat um, joiners in our in our content know that we often have technical difficulties thanks to craziness. Okay, we are getting ready to go live. Good, 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 good. Ask me anything. All right, then I'm gonna put the screen back up for just a second so that everybody can see our upcoming our upcoming events and things happening. We want to make sure that everybody knows what we have going on because we have quite a bunch of stuff happening in the next couple of weeks, which is super exciting. All right, we appear to be live. Okay, let me share my screen really quickly so you guys can see this beautiful slide of events that are coming up. Okay, hopefully everybody is looking at the events. So I'm just gonna quickly go over this while I've got um, everyone's full attention at the beginning and for people who come in um, to watch the replay, here's what we have going on. We have on next Tuesday, we have our self-editing tips after NaNoWriMo or at any point in time that you need help with self-editing tips with Pro Writing Aid. We've got Haley, the, Haley, the lead content creator at um, at Pro Writing Aid is going to come talk to us about how to help people self-edit. So we got a couple questions on editing today um, that I would also encourage you to come and ask all of your editing questions at that point in time to her because I am not an editor, um, but we can research and ask our editor friends questions to get back on any editing questions. Um, okay, then on December 15th, we have our monthly paid training workshop. This is Facebook ads for authors and um, it's going to be awesome. I talked to Ilanka again yesterday and we ironed out the entire um, uh, uh, itinerary for that training workshop. We're going to go over all the basics of why you should use Facebook ads for authors, what the business manager is, what the pixel is. But probably most importantly, um, we're going to get into strategies that work for authors and see how um, we're able to um, you know, you really use those Facebook ads strategies to help you grow your author platform and to sell more books. And then on January 20th, we just slid in a new um, webinar as well. And this is going to be fun. If you've been following along with us on our webinars, we, ha we had a webinar with Fictionary last month. We'll have our pro writing aid webinar on the eighth, and then we had Joelle and Nordstrom from First Editing, another editing company. Uh, she did a presentation. She kicked off the summit last year for us. And the three of these ladies work well together to show authors how they go through the entire process from editing your story structure and editing the story and how you can use Fictionary to do that, to using Pro Writing Aid to help you with the self-editing, to working with um, a real live editor to completely, um, you know, finalize and finesse that final product. 
So that's going to be a great one. You can register for all our upcoming events at womeninpublishingsummit.com forward slash events. And we will continue to add new things as they come along. So check back regularly. Okay, let's get into it. I'm going to start. First of all, hello, everybody. Hope you're having a great day. I'm going to start by answering the questions that came into us via email, because those are people that couldn't attend live. And that way they don't have to um, sit through the entire thing if they don't want to. Um, I would ask you to use if you're here in the broadcast with me, if you can use the Q&A box so that they don't get lost in the chat chatter, that'd be awesome. Um, but if you do put it in chat, we'll, we'll come back around to it. So what is the purpose of these events? And if you're, excuse me, if you're joining us live on, on one of the Facebook pages, you can add your comments right there on the Facebook page and, um, and Nancy will make sure that I see those. So Nancy, we're live on both Women in Publishing Summit and the Right Published Cell Facebook page. So Hey, to anybody who is new to me or just catching this stream um, and, and don't know who we are, I'm Alexa Bigwarf of Write, Publish, Sell and host of the Women in Publishing Summit. And I like to do these Ask Me Anything um, periodically because it's a great opportunity for everyone to come in and just kind of ask the most pressing questions on their mind. This actually started accidentally. We had scheduled an, a webinar and the guest couldn't make it at the last moment. And so we decided to do an Ask Me Anything instead of having the webinar. And it turned out to be a really popular um, event. We had a lot of people ask a lot of questions and it was a great fun for everyone. So I'm going to go ahead and feel free to go ahead and ask any questions that you have, put them in the chat box and I will get to them as I go through these. So um, the first question that came was, I can't attend the ask me anything today, but I do have a question. How can a nonfiction author find speaking gigs? Most devices to Google relevant conferences, but many events are canceled due to the pandemic. So do you have suggestions for how an author can secure speaking gigs right now? Actually, I do. While many live conferences and live events have been canceled, as you mentioned, there are a ton of online conferences happening all the time, similar to the Women in Publishing Summit. I just did an interview today um, on the Women in Publishing Summit. I mean, on another summit, good grief. And um, there are plenty of conferences happening right now because of COVID. So many people are moving their events online and everyone's looking for great presentations. So I, I would continue to Google and look for online conferences, online events for writers, but think smaller. Um, last year in the summer, we had a couple people come talking about talk about getting speaking events. First of all, if you are um, ready to go out and get big speaking events, there are several websites online that offer um, that offer a, a like a composite a composite look at what speaking events are out there across the board and you can actually apply for different speaker events so you can check out sites like that but also look local first um, almost every person that I've talked to about how to start off as a speaker has said that you should really try and start speaking locally before you try and do anything else so if you can contact your local library I don't know how many of you know that many libraries offer all kinds of workshops and um, different opportunities like that. So you can actually pitch your local library and say, hey, I'm Cindy. Um, I talk about health and nutrition or whatever. I would love to give a free workshop at the library and, and have people attend. Now, yes, it's free. And yes, you don't get um, paid for that. But often they'll let you sell your book at these events. But more than anything, it can give you um, ex experience and expertise to put on your resume. So if you're l pitching to bigger events, often larger events want to see some type of B-roll. They want to see some footage of you speaking in an event. So this is why getting on online conferences, getting on um, other things of that nature can be super helpful. And by having maybe someone um, video you while you're doing a local conference at a free event. So it doesn't just have to be your library. You could reach out to your library or your chamber of commerce. They are always looking for opportunities to educate people. So for nonfiction authors in particular, not so much for the fiction authors, unless you have other things happening, there's a, a plenty of opportunity for you to reach out to businesses and organizations in your local area. Maybe you have um, 
a women's service organization that looks for guest speakers in your community. Um, you know, I would I would look at Meetup and see what type types of things are happening, and I would also spend some time on LinkedIn, building relationships with different organizations on LinkedIn. A lot of times, speaking organizations come from relationships that you build with people, and it's really difficult to get picked up to um, to be at a major conference if you haven't done anything else before that. The other thing, just as a side note here, you, you should have a, a pitch sheet available that has what you wanna talk about, what workshops you give and all of those kinds of things that you're able to give out to people that tell them what types of thing, things that you wanna talk about. I am struggling with my words today, good grief. Um, Okay, so on that note, podcasts are a great way to gain exposure and to get experience being interviewed. So I would not um, shy away from trying to find podcasts that you can go out. There are billions of podcasts, it seems like. Lots of opportunities to get out in front of different audiences. And sometimes people will hear you there and want to invite you to do some other things. So, you know, it's it's not super easy to just come out of the gates as a speaker. Um, but there are a lot of ways that you can start really small. You know, someone else once suggested to me joining the local Toastmasters. Now, while they probably are not meeting live, they may be offering... Um, virtual events where you can come in and do Toastmasters. You can reach out to writing organizations. Um, you can reach out to all kinds, whatever whatever comes along with your genre, with what you talk about. There are organizations and there, there are people that are looking for people to come and pitch a, a presentation to. And um, you may find that at the beginning, you have to do a lot of stuff for free. I haven't been paid yet for any of the conferences that I've spoken at, um, one of them. But and also look for your state writing um, groups. So for example, I'm in South Carolina. I'm part of the South Carolina Writers Association. I know that they are currently looking for speakers for their next year's writers conference. I know that the Florida Writers um, Conference just put out a pitch for applications and generally they will bring in people from wherever if you can fill a void for them. So look for writers confer conferences if that's what you're talking about. Obviously that's specific to writers, but any of those things, whatever your genre is, if you write about if you're a dentist and you've written a book for dentists, look for dentist uh, conferences and things like that. Um, but again, start local and look for things. Um, Selena wants to know if I would ever pay to speak on a podcast. And my answer to that is no. Um, I haven't seen a situation where there's any return on investment for that, but I don't, I haven't done any kind of massive um, look into that. There's so many podcasts that are for free. So, I mean, it would have to, I'd have to see who it was and, um, and what, what it was that they were asking for. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to open the Q and a box. Ha, huh, here we go. Let me get, get back into the Q&A. Okay, I have two more questions that were submitted by email that I'm gonna ask um, first. But anyway, just to wrap that up, look for small local events first and um, other opportunities that you can get in there. Okay. All right, now we've got, um, I'm writing in a niche of a Christian historical romance that is hard to categorize on Amazon. I've been calling it retro for lack of better term, but I've been told it's technically historical drama, but that doesn't necessarily work with Amazon categories. My stories are set between 1950 and 1975, maybe retro rom-com. It's fun and we boomers enjoy the memories. So when readers find me, they love it, but I do need to find them. Um, okay, so what I would say is that you should spend some time doing some market research. You should go out and see what other books you may might want to ask your readers what other books they love, or you might want to use a tool like um, um, Publisher Rocket or something like that that helps you find other categories um, and keywords that people are using on similar books and go out and see what other books are are popular in in your niche. So when it comes to Amazon categories, you know, you, you try to look for the ones that make the most sense, but Amazon sometimes puts you in categories based on user experience. So um, look for what is most appropriate to your book, and it might not be a clean, clear cut um, category. So, but I would spend a lot of time looking at other books that your target audience would also enjoy reading that are similar in nature and see where those are primarily, primarily categorized and go from there. Okay. All right. 
This one is a question. Thank you, Grace, for your question about the Oxford comma. I am not an editor, so I don't feel comfortable asking this question. If we have any editors on the line today who want to jump in here, um, she said, the company I write for prefers AP style. The Oxford comma is supposed to be omitted in a simple series list. Does that mean the Oxford comma should be included if the list is not a simple series? That question is beyond me. I will take this and I will post it in our group and I will see if any of the editors in that group can come back and answer that. Great question. I'm sorry, I can't answer it, but we will we will find um, the answer to that. Okay, so that was the, the three questions that came to us earlier. And then there was a fourth one that I didn't add to my list, but was a good question as well. And that was with the new agreement that Ingram Spark sent out, does that mean that you won't be able to distribute your ebook to... Um, Amazon by yourself. I would have to go through and very carefully read the new agreement, but generally, whenever you're working with a distributor, you have the option to choose which sites you are distributing to, or in some cases, if your book is already distributed in ebook format on KDP, for example, then they're not going to override that distribution. However, I do need to dig into that a little bit more. As a side note, I don't ever publish ebooks through Ingram Spark. Um, I always publish them directly on Amazon. And then if we want wider distribution, I use Kobo or I use Publish Drive or I use something else to get them out into the grander marketplace. I just haven't seen um, the distribution through Ingram Spark being something that works well um, for us, for our books. But, um, you know, again, go read through that and you should be able to ask their customer service if you want to just make sure that you understand everything perfectly clear. But generally with a wide distribution, you can opt in or opt out of different places. Okay. All right, now we are to Cynthia's question. Here we go. I'm about to send a draft manuscript to alpha readers for the first time. I think you mean <laughs> beta readers. <laughs> I love that. Um, <laughs> But I like alpha readers too, the very first ones at the beginning, the alpha readers. Um, okay, <laughs> sorry, I don't mean to make fun of you, Cynthia. I'm not making, I'm not making fun of you. That just caught me off guard there. <laughs> um, any suggestions for guidance I should give to them? Two of them who are experts in anti-oppression work um, will actually be paid sensitivity readers, awesome, to help me make my nonfiction book more inclusive, but others are friends and colleagues. Okay, this is a great question. With beta readers. What you want to do is you want to give them very specific guidelines when possible. Um, so for example, are you looking for just um, grammar or are you looking just for um, things of that nature where you want them to very carefully comb the writing and do that? So, you know, that's really what you pay a copy editor for, a line editor for. So um, the beta readers, generally their role is to do a couple of things. You want to make sure that you're get your book makes sense. So ask them specifically, does the order of the content make sense for a nonfiction book or, or yes, this is a nonfiction book. So does the order of the content make sense? Do you understand um, the progression of the book and what the book is trying to achieve? You can ask questions like that. You can say, are there any concepts that I discussed that don't make sense? Is there anything that rubbed you the wrong way or that you felt, especially, it sounds like this is a book that might have, um, some more sensitive material in it. So you might wanna make sure that they didn't feel um, turned off or anything by the material that you were covering. Um, but mo more so than anything, you want to give them permission to be very specific. And to do that, you are get very specific with them on what you need for them. So tell them, you know, look at, in particular, I have concerns about this section. Please make sure you, you review this section quickly and let me know what you think about boom, 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 boom. You can do it specifically like that, or you can just ask for general feedback. But whatever you do, you want to give them some guidelines, especially if there's, if there's anything that you are more concerned about than others and making sure that is corrected. And then of course, if they notice any grammatical spell, spelling errors or um, punctuation errors or anything like that to provide that. But with beta readers, it's really important that you give a, a format for how you want the responses back. Uh, do you want them to make the corrections with track changes in Word or do you want them to send back a list in a Word document that says the page number and, and their thoughts or what they think they have changed? And then make sure that you give them a very specific timeline it's going to fit into your timeline and gives you enough time to make those revisions before you send off to editing. Um, 
And then my final advice on that is to not use too many people and um, and to be careful with the people that you use. For example, I just saw in another group today that she was getting conflicting um, information from her beta readers and her editor on how to capitalize certain things or not capitalize certain things or things like that. So um, when beta readers come back, unless they're trained professional editors, I would be careful about making changes to content that you're not sure about, like should you know, a, a name be um, capitalized or something like that. So um, yeah, I would, but I would, I would hesitate to have more than three to five beta readers, because if you get back a lot of feedback from people, it can be super overwhelming to you and you may not know exactly where to start. Okay. And then the next part, sorry about that. I'm really thirsty today. The next part of that is to, um, I forgot what the next part is. So we're just going to move on. But yes, so beta readers, great part of your process, give plenty of time, give specific deadlines and give specific directions on what you are looking for them to provide back to you. Um, and of course, with fiction, it's going to be a little bit different with fiction, you're going to be looking at people to provide information on the characters and the character development and the story development and whether or not it it is um, believable or whatever you have going on with that. So come up with your list of questions. Oh, I know what I was going to say earlier. Make sure that you give that you give them the opportunity to opt out. So if you let them know this is specifically what I'm looking for, can you do it by this date? Then that gives them the opportunity to say no, they can't or yes, they're clear on on what you need and when you need it. Okay. Hi, Sandy. Okay. Um, I've missed you too. So, okay, Sandy says, I'm done writing my book and I'm working on citations. Oh yeah, my publisher follows Chicago Menu of Style and I am doing my best to get the citations right. But in this age of everything being online, I'm not sure that I'm writing the um, citations 100% correctly. Do publishers or editors typically end up editing citations? Are there specific editors to hire that do this work if the publisher doesn't? You know what, this is a great question for Joellen Nordstrom of um, First Editing to see if they have somebody who specifically does does, um, citations or even to ask some of the editors in the right published cell group if there's somebody in there that does that. Um, I know that when we have sent our books to editors and and it has citations in there, we um, we have asked the editor to make sure that the citations were done properly. Um, Stacy Aronson is an editor that I work with. She's at thebookdoctorisin.com. Um, she's really good at stuff like that as well. So you might just want to um, first ask your publisher, since you are working with a publisher, if this is something that they are going to provide, if they if they will provide an editor that does that level of editing. And if they aren't, then you might want to reach out and hire somebody to help you with that part of the process. But yeah, it's, it's um, especially with a nonfiction book and something like that, it's, it's important to make sure that those are done properly. Okay. Toastmasters meetings all over the world are meeting virtually now, toastmasters.org. Thank you, Karen. Is it Karen or Karen? Karen, I hope I'm pronouncing that properly, sorry. Um, thank you for sharing that. That's, um, oh, she, you're the local club president and Charlotte, I'm in Columbia, whoop. Hey, just down the road, yay, we should connect. Um, so very exciting. She's. I'm gonna drop this comment into the chat so that everybody can see that as well. If you're looking for a way to get started as a speaker, I have just heard so many great things about this being as an opportunity. I think I sidetracked myself, but when when she mentioned Toastmasters as an opportunity, she said a lot of times what happens is you're not only there to become a better speaker, but you wind up networking with people. Or when you're giving your practice speeches, somebody says, you know what, that's a topic I'd really like to put in front of my business or my organization. And so there's generally a, a, um, a great amount of, oops, I just posted that to just the panelists. Let me post that to everybody. A great amount of networking that happens. So thank you for sharing that. Hey, Danielle. What are some of your most preferred or used processes for writing and for managing your work calendar? Oh my gosh, do you want me to talk all day long? <laughs> That's a huge question. Oh my goodness. Okay, so for writing, I am terrible at processes. I'm just going to go ahead and admit that right now. I'm trying to get better at it. I really want to start using Scrivener more for my 
fiction writing, because I do feel that once I've taken the time to learn that tool that I've learned, I've used it for a couple other books and it's, it has such a, um, a valuable layout and setup so that you can create separate parts of the book. Um, you can do all the research and the notes and the character notes and anything like that in it. And for me, I think it would help me keep a lot more organized. And one of the other cool things is that you can also export it to different ways and things like that. So Right now, my current process is that I start every chapter in a Google Doc, and I try to keep the chapters separate at the beginning um, because it can get super overwhelming for me to have a really long um, Word doc. And when if I'm trying to find something or if I remember I want to go back and work on a particular section, it can be really difficult to find things. So I, um, I go into um, a... a a Google Drive and I start a folder for my book and I then go in and I create a, a document for each chapter. And the beauty of this is if you are a sporadic writer like me, and what I mean by that is that I don't necessarily write a book in order. Not necessarily. I never write a book in order. I have yet to write one in order. Sometimes I start in the middle. Sometimes I write the end and then go back to the beginning. Um, this way, I, I just kind of keep them. I title them kind of by the topic. So if it's uh, the fiction book that I'm writing on right now, I'm actually titling by week that I wrote it because I'm working with a writing coach. So that helps um, both the writing coach and I stay on track with where we are. So like I'm about to go into my eighth session with her. So it's titled uh, Callie week eight. Um, and that way I can keep track of, of um, where we are in the process of writing together. So I, I hope that answered your question um, for the writing process. I'm just going to go ahead and say my writing process is all over the place. I am a pantser times a million. Um, I am super like the creative mind, not the organized mind, which does me no favors in the end of the, in the end game, because I wind up having to pull things from all kinds of different places. And it's really, um, can be challenging. So I'm trying very hard to come up with a more, um, <laughs> Danielle, we're like brain twins. Um, I'm trying to be more organized and structured with it so that it's not so painful for me. And the in the end, when I'm pulling it all together, which is another reason why I'm really interested in looking at Scrivener, because I think it helps a little bit with that organization as well but we shall find out. Okay, uh, okay, let's see here. And managing your work calendar. Um, for managing the work calendar, we use Google. It's a shared Google calendar with, um, with my team. And um, I use Google connected to Acuity. And let me tell you, Acuity is the best investment I think I've made for my business yet. Um, so Acuity, it's like Calendly or any of those other things. I really like Acuity because it allows us to set up multiple calendars and um, we can connect payment options. We can connect all of these things. It, it shares directly to Google. It sends out reminders to our appointments. So if you're running any type of business where you have meetings or you're organizing phone calls or anything like that, um, it allows us to set up calendars. So when somebody comes to me and says, hey, I'd like to schedule a discovery call or I'd like to um, schedule a consulting call or I need to get on the calendar for the Women in Publishing Summit, I can create these different things. I block out the time schedule so that I know Thursdays between 10 a.m. and 4 a.m. during conference season are when I'm scheduling my Women in Publishing Summit interviews and I can send them the direct link and they can find the time that works for them based on the parameters that I've established. And then it puts it on my Google calendar and my whole team can see when I'm when I'm in meetings or phone calls or all those kinds of things. It's been a lifesaver for somebody who is um, who is not as greatly organized. It keeps our calendar super organized. Occasionally we still have a double booking because I'll put something on the calendar, but it's usually my fault if there's a double booking. Okay, here we go. I've been promoting my Christmas book. What do I do come January? Hi, Philippa. <laughs> you know, it's funny that you should ask that question because we've been asking this question ourselves. What do we do come January? 
And really, um, I think that what you do between January and say August, when people start thinking about Christmas stuff again, is that you think about the other themes that come in your book. So hello, Philippa. She is um, our author of Rupert Snowman, which we have talked about so much over the last few days, weeks, and months. And I hope that um, that you've all gone and looked at her book because it's awesome. But it is centered around Christmas and winter. So what happens when those are no longer themes? Well, she does have a theme of, um, of compassion and, and other things, empathy and other things that are in this book. So you can do some things about that. But I think that what if you have a seasonal book, the off season, if you will, so basically everything from mid-January until, I mean, people start getting ready for Christmas in about August, is to spend that time developing relationships with people who can help you promote the next time around. So find other book bloggers, find um, businesses and organizations that might want to use your book um, somehow during the winter season. Start looking at bookstores, libraries, other places. When you have the time to develop the relationships and to develop a plan and opportunities to bring the book to them as they get ready for the next year. So yes, subscription boxes, amen. Like you can start building those relationships and seeing who you can um, reach out to, to create those relationships so that when August hits next year, we are ready to rock and roll with uh, throwing different things out to people. Um, because really, if you think about it, I mean, uh, the stores start putting Christmas stuff up in October. So if you haven't already created those relationships in the early months, then it's going to be too late um, by that point in time. So I would say you, you start the publicity always. The publicity never ends. But what you do is you, you back off a little bit on your, you know, um, marketing that's about the book so much and you start doing other things that are related to but maybe not directly to that so maybe throughout the year now you're sharing other children's book authors that write books on empathy that write books that you like and maybe you're doing more of a of a publicity maybe you're doing um, Q and A's with other authors that write those books and you're building those relationships, you're building those connections so that hopefully when your promotion time comes back around, you've got other people that are out there doing your things. This is the time where you can start working on building your, so continuing to build your social media, continuing to build your blog, continuing to build relationships. There's just all that stuff that takes so much time and energy and effort. You now have a window of time that you can do that. <clears throat> Oh, Cynthia, I see. I see what you meant. I'm so sorry. That was silly of me. That, so your alpha readers are your pre-beta readers. Sorry, I uh, <laughs> obviously missed that. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, I'm writing a memoir. <laughs> Excuse me, and I will be using a pen name for privacy purposes. Can you recommend any publishing houses for me? Oh. So Donna, this depends on if you are trying to publish traditionally, if you're trying to go through a hybrid press, um, I would say, let's see, you create, you published the Create Space before and it's on Amazon and you can't afford to self-publish. Okay, well, it's, it's gonna be challenging um, because right now, I mean, the publishing industry is, 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 is flooded. So there's a lot of people um, writing memoirs. There's a lot of people doing this type of thing. So the first thing I would do to you without knowing anything else about you, Donna, or what you have going on is I would suggest that you one, have in have taken some courses on memoir writing or um, or joined a, if you can't afford courses maybe joined some groups of memoirists or um, go to Brooke Warner's website Brooke Warner um, coaching I believe is the full website she has a ton of resources on memoir and make sure that your memoir is sellable so does it fit the parameters of what people are looking for? And then I would suggest that you start building up an audience and I would suggest that you start working heavily on your proposal so that you can see what else, else is out there in the market, um, who your co um, competition is, who your similar books are, and make sure that you are fully prepared with all of your stuff to pitch an agent. I would also suggest that when the Women in Publishing Summit rolls around in March, that you, um, if you haven't already find um, an agent by that point in time, that you spend some time looking for uh, an agent 
um, that we will have an agent in the summit. That's why I mentioned that. But in the meantime, start looking for agents that publish memoir and memoirs, uh, they're so different across the board. So look for an agent who publishes in your your type of memoir, um, but find somebody who can review it and let you know how it's going to do with the traditional publisher, or maybe even um, get some feedback on on um, what you can do to improve it, its chances. But memoir is a memoir is a tough a tough place. So I just want to make sure that you are you know prepared for that. That there's. It, it's it's not easy to find a traditional publisher, but I also want to say there are a lot of very small houses that may want to pick up your book that don't charge any fees that that um, that you should look at. So find a, um, find find some resources, do some googling, look for agents, and also look for publishing houses that take unsolicited manuscripts. So what does that mean? That means that you don't have to have an agent for to submit your book to them. To review, but I would also strongly consider um, having your book reviewed by someone who is a professional in the in the field. Uh, yes, the library is also always a great resource as well. Thank you, Sandy. Um, okay, let's see. <clears throat> Do you have any suggestions regarding reaching out to book clubs? How do we find them? And for those few popular ones, how do we suggest our books to them? Nancy, um, do we have? um the youtube link for casey's interview on book clubs and we could drop that i'm pretty sure that's a that was a a webinar on that we did through the women in publishing summit i'm pretty sure that's a public webinar nancy's grabbing it we'll put that in there that's a resource um as well we did a whole thing on book clubs but you know again i'm just going to tell you google is your friend with stuff like this there are a ton of book clubs out there but if you first of all my first question to you is do you have book club questions prepared are you ready to, I, hopefully you do, um, but if you don't have those out there, then make sure that you have solid book club questions. And then secondly, you can start by looking at Facebook and seeing if there are book club groups on Facebook, or you can go to organizations. Almost every major professional organization has some type of book club. For example, I was in a sorority in college, Kappa Alpha Theta, and um, we have um, a book club for Thetas. Uh, to read, but it's not just Theta offers. They authors they do try to um, to promote the Theta offers, but uh, offers authors. If I could speak today, that would be super helpful. Um, but you can you can reach out and see. Do you do you have to be a member of this organization to submit your book for a book book club um, event? You can just go to meetup.com and see if there are local book clubs. You can start your own book club. There's no reason why you can't start your own book club, um, but look for Facebook groups, look for organizations, contact the admins of the group, say, is this something you would like to do a book club um, event on? Um, I just interviewed Shelly on this topic because she's created some great, great things. Um, and I can't remember if we did this in our other one. I'm sorry, I'm thinking out, I'm processing out loud here. That's no good. I'll come back to that. Um, but yes, the, uh, book clubs and also subscription boxes, book subscription boxes are a great place to look. But I mean, you can always start by asking your friends, asking people in your local group, asking if you go to a church, ask your church if they would host a book club for you. Um, I remember saying that one time and, and the lady was like, um, I'm not exactly comfortable with pitching my book to the ladies of my church. And I'm like, enough said, go find a different group. <laughs> but you know, there's, there's it, it, all of these things though, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to tell you, take time, energy, and effort. And you have to be willing to spend some time to dig in research, look out there, ask questions. If you're on social media, ask it, not in a promotional way. Just be like, hey, are you part of a book club? What's the name? Would you connect me to them? Look for organizations like um, MOPS, the um, the moms group for, um, I forget exactly what it stands for, but there's the MOPS group. They also have a speaking uh, speakers bureau, speakers connection thing where they um, hire speakers for different groups. Um, and meetings. So ask people, go on um, Goodreads. I can't believe I haven't mentioned Goodreads yet. Oh my goodness. That is like the epitome of places to find readers. So go check out Goodreads and see what groups you can slide your way into. But you know what? It comes down to relationships. Nobody wants to just be like, hey, can you do a book club for me? Or hey, can I be part of your book club? Or hey, can you do so-and-so? <coughs> Hope it's not COVID. 
I'm just kidding. That was not a funny joke, but <laughs> not a funny joke at all. I have a little bit of a cold, but it's winter time and cold, but who knows at this time of year, it's scary, isn't it? Um, okay. So I'm going to move on before I say something else crazy. Okay. Uh, when you do reach out to book clubs, um, that may have been your actual question. How do we reach? Well, I answered the, how do you find them? But when you reach out to them, I would suggest that you say a couple of things. Hey, my name is Alexa. I've written this book um, that I think might be of interest to your book club. Let me tell you a little bit about it. Here's the brief synopsis. Um, I'm happy to send you a free copy of it so that you can look at it first and determine if you think the rest of your group would like it, or I'm happy to send you the PDF or something like that. Or even if you're trying to get more eyes on your book, maybe you have it loaded through Book Funnel and you can say, here's my link to Book Funnel. I'll even give it to your whole group to download and read if you guys are willing to leave reviews on Amazon or Goodreads if you loved it. Um, Oh, by the way, if you want to do a live, I know lots of people are doing their book clubs on Zoom right now. If you want to do a live book club, I'm happy to come in and answer the questions for you or do the questions with you or talk about why I wrote the book or whatever. So that's always fun. Um, Casey, the link that we just put in there. Casey um, makes beautiful wine glasses that are in the theme of her of her um, book. It's got a butterfly like what, what was on her book and um, and she gives those to the host. So, you know, sometimes a little bit of bribery goes a long way. Okay, from Julia, before my book launch, I ordered some copies from Ingram Spark so I could fulfill orders for signed books. I'm now out of stock, but I can't get more copies from either Amazon or Ingram Spark until around December 20th. Yep. I did place an order for author copies from Amazon. Customers can buy my book for, on Amazon today and receive it by the end of the week. Someone suggested I tempor temporarily discount the Amazon paperback price, buy copies as a customer. I just had this exact same conversation with another person. This is so strange. I mean, exact same conversation. Um, buy copies as a customer and then bump it back up. Is this a legit strategy or will it raise red flags and cause me problems with my Amazon account? I can't tell you if it will raise flags um, because I don't know about that. I do know that there has been, because when you buy as a customer, um, I don't know if you guys remember, like, I don't know, 50 years ago now, that was actually like maybe early spring when a fairly prominent self-published author got slammed for um, buying copies of his own book. Now, granted, they were accusing him of trying to hit a bestsellers list. So it's a little bit different here, but um, it's not that it's a, it's not that it might be an illegal strategy. It's just not a great strategy, um, I would say. So uh, you're in, you're stuck in a hard place right now because you need books quickly to put them out. Um, but here's what I will say about Ingram Spark. There have been times in the past few months where it's taken a full month for us to get books from them. There have been times when we ordered books thinking it was going to take a month and it took like a week and the books arrived. So sometimes even though they project, they arrive earlier. Um, I don't know if you, did you say specifically you can't, the, the other option that you can do is you can, um, you can tell people that they will be available by January, you know, that it's going to be a little bit longer that you thought, just let your people know you're getting them, but there was a holdup in the ordering process and, and you'll send them out to them as soon as you can. I mean, it may feel like December 20th may feel like eons from, from away from us right now, but it'll be here really quickly. And most people are so busy right now. Um, unless they have a specific need for your book prior to that, in which case then you could just ship them one directly from Amazon um, in onesies and twosies. But I don't, I don't want to go on record as ever telling somebody that the appropriate thing to do is lower your price, buy a bunch of copies and ship it out. It doesn't sit well with me. So if that's what you decide to do, that's what you decide to do. But um, it's certainly not something I'm going to um, weigh in on. Um, but this does go to a larger picture. So what I told um, the other gal that was having a conversation is she's got an event in 12 days. She only had 20 books on hand. Um, she has the same situation. She's afraid that the books won't get there until after the event. And so what I told her that she could do is um, still collect payment from people and let them know the situation. Her event is at her church with people that she knows. So it's a tiny bit of a different situation than cold um, people, but 
she, I said, since it's this particular situation, you could sell the 20 copies that you have. And if, if more people want to buy them, then collect payment, get all their information, place the order now, as soon as you can. So as when the books arrive, you have them and then deliver them to the church and, and talk to the church and see if they'd be willing to hold them in their office and people give a list of the people who paid and, and give it out to them like that. So, you know, it, it raises the bigger question of, are you prepared as a as a retailer because and now as a self-published author you are also a retailer so when you are preparing for publication and for pre-orders and for all of those things you should order enough um you should it's beside the point now julia i'm sorry that you know there's no way to come back and and fix that at this point in time other than maybe asking your people if if they're okay waiting a little bit longer explain the situation most times people are okay when they understand what's happening um especially if they really want to sign a copy the other thing that we have done from people for people is if they are super anxious, you can order book plates and you can sign your name on the book plate and you can say, you know, I don't know if they've pre-ordered from you, if they've already paid you or, um, or if these are giveaways or what the situation is. But um, you can, if somebody really wants the book and they really want a signed copy, you can direct them to buy on Amazon and then say, I'll drop a book plate in the mail to you. And you can, um, and you can do that. Yeah, that's great. If they're available in local indie bookstores, then you can, um, that, that's a great opportunity too. So uh, I just got an update that I don't think everybody can say that she said, I directed a local customer to go to an indie bookstore if they needed copies quickly. Or, I mean, but what? why can't that? Uh, yeah, yeah, either way, that's great. But I would encourage everybody who's for a future situation to expect that it's going to take both Ingram Spark and Amazon three to four weeks to fulfill your author book co cover copies, book copies. So please make sure that you always assume a month, always assume that you're going to need a month and make sure you are prepared. I like to have, it, depending on what type of, of launch event you're having, when we're doing live events and people are going to be there and sharing and you've invited a bunch of people, I like to order 200, 100 to 200 copies. But um I like for everybody to consider ordering 50 copies ahead of time, um, which you can only do if you're going through Ingram Spark because you can't order copies ahead of time on KDP. Um, but you can, you know, make sure that you're prepared if you think you're going to get picked up. Because sometimes you just you just don't know. Somebody might see about your launch event and want you to come do an event immediately following and you want to make sure that you're able to fulfill those orders. I wouldn't suggest you order hundreds of books without knowing anything yet about how your book is going to perform. But, um, you know, please, please um, consider that timeline when you're thinking about books that you need. But I mean, again, the books could print faster than they have suggest they have um, put in there. So maybe you'll get them faster than than they're saying. Okay. What is the best, most affordable way to market your book? Oh my goodness. Build relationships, get in front of people, talk about it, but not just about your book, talk, find organizations or people that are going to be interested in your book. Um, oh my goodness. We could spend all day long just talking about this because it's going to be 100% varied on genre, on um time frame on timeline. I'm going to tell you right now, um, sales on December 1st, after all the Black Friday madness are in the toilet. So like if you're trying to get out in, in when there's all kinds of noise and everything happening, it's really, really difficult. So, um, you know, you can, you, you you can go out and and kind of get a feel for what's happening. Um, I, I love to use the example of my friend Christy who wrote a, a book, a cookbook about recipes that were discussed in the Gilmore Girls. And it was just pure luck that when she decided to do this book, they re-released Gilmore Girls on Netflix. So there was all kinds of publicity about Gilmore Girls. So she started researching the people who were talking about the Gilmore Girls, bloggers, journalists, all those things. And she reached out to them, let them know what she was doing. And a lot of them wanted to interview her and wanted to talk about her. So if there's a theme that's bigger with your book, who's talking about those themes? And how can you strike up relationships or be interviewed or write for um, the right for their 
website or organization or any of those things. There's so many, so many things. Um, but yeah, that's, it's just, it's, I mean, uh, the, 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 the sky is the limit, really. The sky is the limit on, on uh, affordable ways. But I am going to just be really honest and say, in this day and age with so many books, you really need to invest in some, in some advertising and marketing to get to the next level, really. Okay. Oh, yay, Karen. Okay. Uh, let's hear it from the South. We, we will, I assume you're on my email list now, so I'll reach out to you. <laughs> Okay. What should we do when we have an idea, but we don't have any words to write? Um, I'm going to ask you to give me a little more details here because I can dig into it if I know a little bit more what you're writing about. So the details I'm looking for from you are, one, what genre are you writing in? And two, um, ha have you done any type of brainstorming, mind mapping, snowflake method, any of those things? So while I'm waiting for you to um, provide, pop back in and they're saying um, to, to give me a few more details, what we do is we start, I have a program <laughs> called Jumpstart Your Book and it's, um, it's, it, it works for fiction and nonfiction authors. I will say um, fiction, I have had some fiction authors go through the program who have told me that it helped them get going, but I think that it works best for nonfiction authors. But the concept is the same across the board. When you have your idea, you start by brains, by just sitting down. Don't try and write the story if you're not ready to write the story yet. Like I may have an idea for this book, but if I don't know the things that I want to happen in it, um, it's it's really hard to just sit down and write unless you are a, a pantser, like you just love to sit down and free write. So some of the ideas on, on there are to start with writing prompts because maybe you just need help with getting fam um, familiar with your craft. Maybe you just need um, ways to help you practice starting writing. So there's so many ways you can do prompts. There's free prompts, there's groups that do prompts, there's writing groups, there's books on prompts, there's all kinds of prompts. And this just helps you um, sit down and, um, and help get started with it. Um, so, oh, Nancy just reminded me, we actually have a, 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 one of the first things I ever created was a 30 days to help you start writing your book. <laughs> So she is going to put the link in uh, to that. So that, that should help you, give you some ideas on how to get started. But um, for nonfiction, I started with talking about the mind mapping, you know, sitting down and putting that central idea on the center of your page. So my next book, third one in the series, we've got Ditch the Fear and Just Write It, Ditch the Fear and Just Market It. And now it's going to be Ditch the Fear and Just Publish It. So when I'm going to put publish in the middle of the page. And I'm just going to start thinking about, okay, if I want to help somebody publish their book, what are all the things they need to know? I mean, there's all the obvious things like what's an ISBN? Where do I get an ISBN? What's an, uh, an imprint? How do I know, you know, where to find an imprint? Is, do I have to, um, you know, start a company or, to publish a book? Do I have to, um, how do I find keywords and categories? Like all the things I'm just going to sit down and I'm just going to brainstorm out all of these different things. And then I'm going to take those ideas and I'm going to organize them. And that starts you in a, a you know process of, okay, now I know what to write about because I can take any of these things and I can just start writing. So on the fiction side, again, you can do a similar thing. Okay, I'm writing a book about a girl um, in Paris falls in love with the French dude? What are the things that I want to have happen? Um, what's the inciting incident going to be? What's going to grab everybody's attention? What's going to hold them? What's the climax going to be? How's it going to resolve? Who are the main characters? What are they going to be doing? What's their story? Um, all those types of things. I would also like to give another plug for um, Fictionary and some other tools like that. Now, granted, Fictionary is once you've already started writing, you've got it'll help you make sure that you have a story structure in place. But I would guess that um, on their blog, 
um, they, they may have some articles and things that help you out with that. Pro Writing Aid also has a tremendous blog that I am sure has stuff like this. I would go to Google again and I would say, you know, if you're working on fiction, like how do I, how do I write my story out there? We have tons and tons of people out there who can help you do that. Join a writing group. Um, but I would say my, my, my gut instinct is that it is a problem because you have this idea for a story or you have this idea for a book, but you don't know how to set up the container for what all needs to happen in that book, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. So if you go, if you're writing nonfiction or fiction, the program, we have it set up for fiction, nonfiction, and memoir. But if you go to writepublishedcell.com forward slash jumpstart, um, you can find that program to help you work through a training workshop to get you started um, or, you know, grab any number of resources out there or just Google and see what's out there for free. But I would really spend some time just trying to figure out what it is you want to happen in your book, no matter the genre. If it's a nonfiction book, what do you what do you want the person to gain by the time they're done with that book? and then list out the things. And then those are the things you write about. And it doesn't have to be an order. If you're, if you're, I tend to get paralyzed when I think about all the things that should happen in a book. Like when I start thinking about the finished product, I shut down. And um, I was just having this conversation yesterday about how like, I can see the book, I can see the idea, I see all the things. And then I sit down on my computer and I'm like, uh, what do I do? So, um, stop thinking about the end and just think about the micro. Think about writing. I love Anne Lamott's book, Bird by Bird. And the thing that stuck out to me the most about that book was this idea that we get so stuck, like before we've even written five words, we're already thinking about, you know, all of the stressful things that go along with publishing the book. So stop right there and just write one paragraph, write about one character. I think she talks about like, write about when your first character enters the scene, you know, the scene where they enter the book or just start there. And you know what? I did that and I wound up writing 3000 words in one night. So it was amazing. Um, and then the other part of that, um, Nancy, will you drop the link to the jumpstart course too? Oh, you, you did, um, from idea to outline in one hour, but let's do writepublishedcell.com um, forward slash jumpstart as well. They're a tiny bit different. Um, so <sighs> where was I? Okay. So yeah, just start small, start really small and, and, and start with some type of of outlining to help you get going. And we must might have lost that person or maybe my answer was okay. But um, if you have a follow-up answer or follow-up question, don't hesitate to ask. Okay. What time are we at? We have four minutes to go. So I'm gonna try and get to these last two questions here and then we're gonna wrap it up for today. But I do want to tell you about a couple of things before, before we do that. First of all, if you weren't here when we first started, please go to womeninpublishingsummit.com forward slash events so you can see what all we have training coming up. We have several free webinars coming up and we have several paid training events coming up. We have a, a self-editing course with Pro Writing Aid coming up. We have a, a Facebook ads training, which is going to be amazing. It's for it's beginning Facebook ads going right through and talking about all the key things that you need to know so you don't waste a bunch of time and money, plus the strategies that are generally the most effective. Then we have um, a membership program that I didn't tell you guys about that's starting, and I'm going to show you that screen in a minute. But um, okay, let me get back to Cynthia's question here. I see people in the writing community saying they sent a nudge to literary agents when querying. What does this mean? Agents seem to be clear that they don't want to be contacted after the query, but it's getting to, on to be months since I queried some of these folks. Is there an appropriate way to reach out to them without irritating them? So there's no one right answer to this question because it's really going to depend on the agent. What I would say is if it's been months, um, I would first go to their website and see specifically many of them have very specific guidelines for submission on their website. And if they don't want to be bothered again, it will be stated. 
um, or if it says something like we are open for submissions between January 1st and June 1st, then don't bother them until after June 1st, because that means they're reviewing everything during that window. And once they've reviewed everything, then they will contact people. Um, but it varies so much from agency to agency, person to person, publishing a house to publishing house. So I would first see if they have anything on their website that says, here are my submission guidelines. Here's what you can expect to hear from me. Um, and here's, if you don't hear from me by this date, follow up. Then the second part of that is that there are, everybody is super overwhelmed with submissions and things. So there are things that fall through the cracks. There have been a couple of times where we completely missed a submission. So I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to reach out and just say, hey, you know, just checking in, but again, check their, check their guidelines. And I would give them a fair amount of time before you start pestering them and just, you know, give them um, the opportunity to that. So, but, but, you know, be gentle in, in your response. I know you probably have a ton of submissions to look at. Um, I sent you this on this date, maybe give them a little synopsis to jog their memory or something and just let them know or ask if they are still reviewing or if they've made a decision. Okay, hi Marlene. There's so many strategies for marketing. If I could choose just one strategy other than friends and family to sell my nonfiction on adulting, which one should I choose? My book release is Saturday. Oh, Marlene, I wish you'd asked me this question about six months ago. Um, at this point in time, I would suggest that you try and, um, oh my goodness, um, try and maybe, oh, that's a short time frame. So it's not too late to um, maybe see if you can submit some articles to some online websites on this topic. They may not run for a little while, but you could have them out there. You might want to talk, um, see if you can find some podcasts. Um, I don't know if you're involved with um, social media, but you can definitely post on social media. Uh, I would give your book to as many people as you possibly can and ask them to read it, review it, and share their reviews. Um, and it doesn't have to be the print copy. You can give them the PDF or an ebook version of it. So um, yeah, you're going to have to hit the ground running with, with your launch to continue marketing, but I would try and fill your schedule with interview opportunities, with opportunities to either submit articles or blog posts or um, writing for magazines that cover these topics. Um, you could pitch the media if you've got a time relevant um, topic that you can pitch the media to. And um, and yeah, just the best thing you can do is tr try and create buzz and word of mouth marketing. Okay. My heroine had left home and lives with friends. What do I call that place? Home? Her friend's house? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I guess if she left her home, you could say she left her home or where she grew up and now her home is her friend's house. That's a great question. I would, uh, without any other context, that's really hard to answer. So um, I would suggest that you maybe go into some writing groups and ask this question. There's tons of writing groups on, um, on Facebook or in other places online. Really, 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 I can't impress to you enough how important it is to work on your craft and to find other writers and to get in those groups with them and to do, join critique groups and all those kinds of things. Those are great questions for, um, for other writers as well. Whoo, we did it. One hour in the books. Okay, everybody. Um, I'm just going to quickly show you this beautiful slide that Nancy made for us because I want to very, very quickly talk about this. I'm not going to spend more than two seconds on it, but we've decided to create a monthly, it's more like a mentorship program. Basically, when you come into the program, you get one, one hour of Q&A with me a month like this, except for we're going to offer it every month and for only our members. Um, and we can bring you into the Zoom room with us so we can actually have conversations. Um, we're also bringing in my entire team for one hour a month where you can ask about social media, you can ask about finding reviewers, you can ask about all of those things. I'll try and pull in some editors because we've get, we're getting a lot of writing and editing questions as well. You get access to our monthly paid workshop. So right now we're doing um, Facebook ads for authors. 
Um, and then we will have four mini coaching sessions, hot seat power coaching sessions a month that you can apply for. And then we'll have a private Facebook community where we can do all of these fun things together as well. So if this is something that sounds of interest to you, we actually kicked it off um, yesterday. And our first live Q&A is tomorrow. So I know you just came out of a Q&A. You might be like, whoa, that's a lot. Um, but you can still join us. And if you have residual questions or other things that you want to do, um, and the price for this is $47 a month, which is super reasonable. And um, there's no commitment to stay. So if you come in one month and um, you get all your answers and that's all you need, um, or you came in so that you could save $3 on the $50 um, Facebook ads thing and get all these other stuff. That's cool too. But just wanted to share that with you because we do want to create a, a resource that allows people to, um, to get their questions answered without having to pay for consulting fees and all of that, that kind of stuff. You'd be surprised what we can answer in a short period of time to save you a bunch of time and energy. And we only do this Q&A once a quarter and actually it's actually going to be once well we'll have something um, similar with the women in publishing summit so we'll have one next quarter as well but um thank you everybody for being here i really appreciate it i think we got all the questions answered and um yeah we will see you all soon don't forget to go to women in publishing summit.com forward slash events to see what all is happening and what is up and coming and we will hopefully see most of you back for the self all of you had editing questions please sign up for the pro writing aid um, webinar it's a free webinar next tuesday and come ask haley all of these questions okay thanks so much have a great great day